Welcome to the Holistic Health Bites podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Nicholson, crime scene investigator turned functional health investigator. This podcast is here to share bite-sized episodes and unique interviews on a wide variety of health topics to empower, enlighten, and educate you to live your best, most vibrant life. Disclaimer, all information you hear on this podcast is for information only and constitutes individual opinions of the person speaking. This should not be taken as medical advice. Being a listener of this show does not initiate a practitioner-client relationship between you and the hosts or panelists on this show. Please discuss these topics with your medical professionals before making any changes to your health. Okay, let's dive in. Welcome back to the Holistic Health Bites podcast. Today, I'm joined by a special guest, colleague, and friend, Katrina Foe, who's going to tell us all about her specialization in cancer, specifically as it relates to metabolic disorders. So welcome, Katrina. Wow, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So can you tell everyone just kind of a brief story, how you got into this space and a little bit about you? Yeah, so... I um, was into health, but was not a practitioner when I got my cancer diagnosis and knew in my heart that because of different health journey issues that we had already been on, I wanted to address it naturally, which I totally get. That's not the path everyone takes and that's fine. But for me, that was the clear path. And I sought out answers because clearly I, I, while I was already doing a lot of work on my health, something wasn't working. So I went down to a clinic in Mexico and was actually kicked out because I asked too many questions. Um, I know, right? Um, And eventually found my functional practitioner that helped me determine what were the root causes of my cancer and address those naturally, which led me to want to understand more because (laughs) the body was so amazing and what it did. And that's where I dove in and became a practitioner. And now I get to do the same work, which is incredibly powerful and exciting. Oh, so amazing. I love it. And like all of us, you know, or pretty much everyone, we all get into this for a reason. And a lot of times it's our own journey that got us started on it. So I think that's, you know, a common story. How long ago was your cancer diagnosis? It was in 2015. Okay. So you're quite a few years out of it now and obviously thriving. Yes. I'm past the randomly designated five-year mark. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. We're going to dive into all that for sure. So you mentioned that it was really important to you to find out, you know, why you had this cancer to begin with. So what is it that people need to know about that piece of this whole puzzle? I think that was the saving grace because I have this insatiable curiosity that my mom has always teased me about. And that I think was what saved me because I was leaning more towards a vegan, like everything was talking about raw juicing, all this stuff and knowing what I know now and having asked the questions that I didn't get answers to from that clinic. um, I know that that would have been like a disaster for my body. Um, and the things that I've now seen are issues, they, that was going the wrong direction. So for me asking questions, I just encourage everyone do not just take your practitioner's word, like do testing, like find out what is going on, listen to your body and ask the questions. Um, for me, the biggest thing was just setting my bias aside and really evaluating everything you know, from scratch, that was huge. And it was hard because I had my own preconceived notions of what I thought was good and bad. And honestly, there's so much confusing information out there. I see this all the time with clients when they come in, they're like decided this is what it has to be. And I'm like, clearly that's not working for you. Let's open up and, and do some tests and see if that's what your body needs or not. And Unfortunately, not everyone is open to that. And that's, um, that's something I encourage people with. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you've found through your personal journey and with working with these clients that is kind of that why behind getting cancer? I mean, there's the low hanging fruit, like smoking, obviously we know these things, but what are some of the other whys that people do get these cancers? Absolutely. 
I love this question. This is this is my jam. So there's 10 areas that we've identified with research that are known drivers of cancer. And we have functional tests to see which ones of these are the issues. So um, for me, I had insulin resistance, which I had no idea about. And this falls in the metabolic bucket. But the interesting thing with insulin resistance is you don't feel that. You feel really good because you've got tons of blood sugar and fuel running around in your body. And people don't get that. You know, really, you can only see that on a test. Um, my hormones were wacky. That's another one of the buckets. My, I had uh, estrogen dominance and a nice hypothyroid, which I had, again, no idea. I thought I was feeling kind of tired because I had had five children, you know, and people are keeping me up at night, but there was more behind that. Uh, my microbiome was pretty shot. I had counted up. I had over 30 rounds of antibiotics growing up um, and a lot of things, issues in there in terms of digestion. I wasn't digesting things very well. Uh, angiogenesis is another one of the buckets. This was not one of my big areas, but it, it is for a lot of people. And this is a fancy term that means when a cell turns cancerous, it needs an immense amount of glucose, so that blood sugar, in order to rapidly grow. And it will actually signal the body to create more blood vessels so it can get more blood sugar. And we can see this on different tests. Um, stress, this was huge. I had just moved to a different state where I did not have a support friend network. Um, and there was a lot going on in terms of shifting uh, moving, all that kind of stuff. And you can see a lot of this stuff on the adrenals. So the circadian rhythm. And then, like I said, I just had a baby. So that was just kind of wonky to say the least. Um, another one of the buckets is environmental toxins. And people, a lot of times will tell me, no, 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 I'm super clean, Katrina. And so was I, like we were making our own cleaning products and toiletries and we had moved out to the country but what I didn't know is that when we moved, we moved into a house that had insane levels of toxic black mold. So I didn't know this. I wasn't having symptoms of the mold, but that was one of my huge drivers, um, along with some other toxins in terms of environmental chemicals that I didn't even know. <laughs> I couldn't even tell you what the names of them were in, in a lot of regards. Um, epigenetically, so we know that certain genes you can turn on and off by different diet and lifestyle choices. And just the way I'm set up, I suck at detoxification. I am terrible at methylating. I do not do well absorbing vitamin D. So there's certain things that, again, when you don't have high enough levels of vitamin D, you're more predisposed to having cancer. So there was a lot of this that I was working against in knowing my genetics was really helpful to know where to support myself. Um, immune, when the immune system gets overwhelmed, it can't do its job to address cancer like it's supposed to. Uh, now I'm blessed, I don't have any autoimmune issues, but I did have that vitamin D issue, which is part of the immune system. And this is an area you wanna make sure to look at. Inflammation. With cancer, it's a huge ball of inflammation. And I definitely had some inflammation markers, but this probably wasn't the biggest area for me. And the bigger area is the last bucket, which was the mental emotional component. Um, and this is an area that's typically overlooked and kind of brushed aside or, or, oh, go deal with that on your own kind of thing. And it's taken me a while to get around to fully resolving and dealing with some of these issues, but I had a lot of, um, mental, emotional traumas going on that were not fully addressed. And I find that with my clients, usually the year prior to a diagnosis of cancer, there's something that has really impacted the cancer client's heart, whether it's a death of a loved one, a, 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 a relationship that's toxic, whatever, there's something going on there. Yeah. I think that's such a powerful list and it applies to more than just cancer. So even if you're like, ah, oh, I'm good. I don't have cancer. I've never had cancer, but you have diabetes, you have dementia, you have, I mean, name it. Those same 10 buckets are going to be underlying all of those conditions as well. Yes, exactly. And here's the interesting thing. So for me personally, my dad has 
pretty uh, advanced dementia. And I can see that in my genetics, I have a predisposition and all of these things that I'm talking about and sharing with you are all things that are off with clients with dementia. So the cancer has been a huge blessing in a lot of ways, but one of them is that I'm getting the tools now proactively to be able to make sure that I don't go down that dementia road, which to me, uh, that's scarier. I don't want to lose my brain. That's a really important one. Yeah. Same, same. Absolutely. That's one of my main drivers is to keep my mental and physical faculties as long as possible. Absolutely. So you talked a little bit about that you had been going down the vegan route. So let's just dive into the diet piece. So what have you seen in your own journey and with your clients and through your education are the things that people maybe do wrong when it comes to diet and what should we be prioritizing instead? Yes, this is huge. So a lot of people are talking about plant-based and there's two components to this that really make it not the best option, especially for cancer clients. So one is the fact that it's going to be driving a lot of the blood sugar issues. So when you are plant-based, um, it, it doesn't require that you're low fat, but you're not eating the animal products. And usually there's a, a connection with the lower fat. Um, especially if you're vegan, like it's not going to be something where you can get enough to uh, really get into ketosis. Now, what I talked about with the metabolic aspect of cancer, you know, Otto Warburg won the Nobel Prize back in the 30s for his work defining that a cancer cell is shifted metabolically so that it's anaerobic and it, it needs so much more blood sugar. That's just a defining factor. And this is actually how PET scans work. Mm -hmm. um, so they feed you radioactive sugar because they know that the cancer cells will gobble up the sugar and thus get the radioactivity to then show up on the scans. So it just boggles my mind why they're not suggesting, hey, maybe we should reduce the carb load. Maybe we should not feed the chemo clients cookies and juice like this is insane because it's in the research. This is not some weird Katrina says some bizarro thing. This is standard knowledge. Um, so when you're doing a plant-based diet, like it's kind of an interesting thing because most of my clients, when I get them on a ketogenic diet, I want them on a very clean, but it's, it's plant rich. So the predominance of the plate looks like plants. They've got a big salad or lots of vegetables, cruciferous stuff. But then that's just the conduit to carry the fat. And the fat you don't really see, it kind of melds into the rest of the food. And then maybe you've got a little protein as a garnish. It's not a high protein diet, but there is animal products. And this is the interesting thing. So the animal products are important because it's more bioavailable. And especially when you're talking about something like cancer, we want to take everything we can of extra work and burden off of the body. So let me, let me back up. So for example, when you're vegan, vegetarian, a lot of times they'll talk a lot about juicing and specifically carrot juicing because, you know, carrots have all this vitamin A, right? Well, carrots actually have zero vitamin A in them. It's not vitamin A, it's beta carotene, which you're like, yes, I know it's crazy, right? Beta carotene is the precursor, which then your body has to convert to vitamin A. And that sounds like no big thing, but again, that's one more thing for your body to have to do when you have cancer and it's already drowning. And now, not everybody's good at that conversion. Like genetically, some people cannot make that conversion. Yes. And that was exactly, you took the words out of my mouth. That was brilliant. So it's about 30% of the population can't do that. And this is one of the things that we look at in the genetics is can they do that? And usually it's the cancer clients that can't. And this is something that is predisposing them to having issues and leading to that perfect storm of developing cancer. So with the plant-based diet, not only are you getting this huge amount of carbohydrate load, which a lot of them can't handle, but also they're not getting the most bioavailable, viable nutrition. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big deal. And I know I've had family members and friends who've had cancer and they do get that message of like, just eat anything you can. It doesn't matter. Just get all the calories. And I know 
The fear oh. behind that is the cachexia, where they're actually wasting away and losing too much weight. Okay. Yeah, I just have to jump up in. on sugar. It's the wrong way to do it. <laughs> yeah. So here's the crazy thing. That's exactly why they're doing it. They don't want them to waste away with cachexia because that's usually what kills cancer clients. But here's the thing. What is the best thing to avoid cachexia is the ketogenic diet. So right. if yeah, they, I diet. would rather my clients fast and get into a ketogenic state to avoid cachexia than eat the carbs. Obviously, even better option would be to do a high fat ketogenic diet to where they're getting the ketones to avoid the cachexia and they're getting to eat food. But this is insane because again, that's in the research. This is not a hidden, you know, secret thing and they're not using it. They just want to get people the easy thing and they tell them all the time, diet doesn't matter. I get that from my clients, but my doctor said, and I'm like, it does. It does. And usually the people that want to do this work have some kind of instinctive gut understanding that diet does matter. And it's not from the place of like, you're a bad kid. You ate the wrong foods. Now it's your fault. You have cancer. Usually my clients come and they are eating an amazing pristine diet. They're eating better than I might eat. It's just maybe there's some tweaks in what they're eating. And then there's all these toxins and other areas like hormones that are off that they don't know are off. It's not that they're doing, you know, standard American diet at all. Right. Yeah. It's such an important thing that the, the benefit I find in the ketogenic diet that I think a lot of people don't really talk about is it's truly the best anti-inflammatory diet. Yes. So not only are you preventing that muscle wasting and loss of healthy tissue, you're giving an alternate fuel to all of your cells. You're reducing inflammation, eliminating toxins. You're stimulating a lot more bile to be released with all the fat. And so that's going to, you know, eliminate those toxins. And it, there's just so many amazing benefits that I think this is a tremendously overlooked thing. And I'm with you. It drives me nuts when I hear people say that their doctor told them diet doesn't matter, whether yeah. that's because they have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, or they have you know, dementia or gallbladder issues or whatever their problem is. I've heard this from a lot of different people from a lot of different specialists that it doesn't matter. Of course it does. Of course it does. It's the building blocks of everything in your body. Of course it matters. Literally. Yes. And the interesting thing that, you know, sometimes people don't know is that the, you know, you hear all about antioxidants and you need to eat more antioxidants and all this stuff. But if you stop needing as many antioxidants, that's going to be more powerful. And the, the biggest source of oxidants to, that you need for the antioxidants is your own metabolism. So back in, you know, science in high school, you probably heard of the Krebs cycle, you know, for, I know, you know, it, Andrea, but uh, <laughs> that is where if you're burning carbs, that's where you're going to produce the most oxidant, uh, components and those oxidative stress comes in from your actual metabolism. So if you can shift to burning fat for fuel, you've just eliminated a huge source of oxidation, which reduces the need for all the antioxidants and takes a huge stress off your body. And people aren't talking about that. And it's simple. It's just a, a cleaner fuel source to burn. Yes. Yes. And people, when you finally get into that state, you truly feel amazing. It, it's quite shocking. So yeah, I know it's so counter. It takes a while to wrap your head around like doing the opposite of what we've been told your entire life where you actually want to lean into all the fats. You want to eat all the fats. You only want to eat when you're hungry. You don't need to eat every two hours. Like all of the things you have to basically eliminate everything you've ever been, been told and do the exact opposite. And you'll probably feel amazing. I know I grew up with all the low fat mantra, my mom was always on a diet. I mean, I, she's tried so many diets. It's insane. But I remember my sister and I having competitions of who could eat the least amount of fat in a day. <laughs> like when we were 13, 14, like how, I mean, terrible yeah. for our bodies, but like that mantra and that mindset is so ingrained. Like even now, after I've been doing crazy high fat for over a decade, it still feels like a little naughty, like, <laughs> and it's, it's amazing. Mind yeah. blowing. So yeah. I get it when people come to me and they're like, really, really? And 
over and over, I'm like, no, no, you need more fat. No, you need yeah. more. It, it has to be super intentional to get high enough. And it just blows people's minds every time. But when they get there, like you said, it feels so good. Your brain just lights up and things start yeah. working better. And for the most part, your body has a tolerance level for how much fat you can keep as far as like from the diet. If you overdo it on how much your body can actually handle, how much your body needs, you'll just eliminate it. Exactly. And so and in the early days, you might find that you have a little bit of loose stools while your body's adapting to the higher fat. But within a few days, maybe a week or two, then if you're still getting loose stools, there's something else going on. Yeah. And one of the biggest problems and challenges that I find with people when they're shifting onto a ketogenic diet is that they don't know how to digest that fat well. Right. And they're having a lot of nausea and they're like, no, I don't want to eat that much fat. I'm like, okay, that's not a, I don't want to eat that much fat because the, I don't need it. It's because I, my body knows it can't deal with it. And so some gentle supports, um, usually clear that right up, but this is really common. I think it's because we've had this growing up without having fat, you know, and a lot of gallbladders are not really doing their thing the way they should. So addressing that, you can see that on tests to corroborate what we're experiencing symptom wise, but it's, it's really powerful. Yeah. yeah. So we talked a little bit about the types of proteins and a lot about carbs and specifically from plants. What about the types of fats? Do you tell people to like prioritize a particular, you know, saturated or unsaturated, or is it just like, as long as it's a natural whole fat, go for it. Do you have a preference on what types of fats? Oh, so many good things there. So first thing, absolutely none of those vegetable oils. That is a big thing. And a lot of times um, I just mention it because people still sometimes, even though they know that they'll, they won't see it in products. So especially if you go to a restaurant, you need to understand that it's a business and they're going to be using the cheap oils. And so things are going to be cooked in canola oil and all the salad dressings, mayonnaise, all that is going to be bad fats. So the biggest thing I say is, you know, just bring your own salad dressing, which sounds kind of over the top bizarro, but it, you can always get a salad, bring the dressing. And I like to prioritize organic with the fats because, hey, like 80% of the diet's fats. Let's make sure that that large amount you're getting from a clean source. Plus, if they're animal fats, where does the animal store the toxins in the fat? So we want to make sure that that is pristine. And usually people are hyping up all the vegetables being organic. And that's great. It's important. But if 80% of the diet is fat, that's what I care about. And that's actually more important to me than the vegetables, which might sound a little weird if you have to pick your battles. Um, the other thing is that you want to think about which ones you cook with. So the saturated fats are the ones that are solid at room temperature. So um, butter, lard, ghee, um, coconut oil, those kinds of things are what you want to cook with. And personally, I'm going to use my, my unsaturated fats as more like salad dressings, drizzle on top kind of stuff. Um, avocado oil is amazing for mayonnaise, that kind of thing. Um, it, it has no taste, which is lovely for any kind of dressings and sauces, but I don't really cook with them that much, which is kind of controversial, but to me, I'm like, why, why take the risk of damaging it all? I think that maybe a light saute or a little um, oven work might be okay with some of those monounsaturated fats, but wouldn't it be better to just put the coconut oil or butter on it and not have to take that chance? Because the research really is not fully out on that yet. Um, but I like people to get a variety. A lot of times people get in their rut. I only do this. And I, I like to, you know, throw in different un, uh, oils into the salad dressings. You're not going to notice the taste difference, especially if it's something strong like a balsamic vinegar or something. But that's just going to give you different nutrient profiles, which can be really nice. Yeah, I love that. And so even when we talk about just the ketogenic diet, obviously a ketogenic diet for a cancer patient, someone who's actively going through cancer is probably going to be a little bit different than someone who just maybe wants to lose weight or improve metabolic health, but doesn't have maybe, you know, a serious diagnosis like a cancer. Do you see that there's differences in the application of ketogenic diet? Like you really want the super high fat on a cancering patient. Do you find that that's true for, I know you primarily work with cancer, but do you see that is true for maybe people who aren't actively in cancer. 
Yes. Yeah, so depending on the purpose, you're going to have a different uh, goal. So with uh, ketosis, you know, the, the cutoff line is 0.5 to 0.7, depending on who you talk to, of where you're officially in ketosis. And that up to like maybe two or so is considered nutritional ketosis. And that's what you're going to be getting if you're just manipulating your diet. That's the first level with my clients. Um, I want them to have a really strong foundation of how do I get there? And then what kicks me out? Because it's different for different people. It might be an argument with a spouse. It might be, I had one client that it was red bell peppers, which is not a high glycemic food, but she probably had a sensitivity to it. So dialing that in, and that's the place where most people are going to stay and where you hear stuff on the internet about ketosis. For cancer, though, I want to get them further past nutritional ketosis into a therapeutic ketosis where they're in the three, four, five, six, seven range. And you will have to have uh, additional things besides just diet. So prior, uh, predominantly things like exogenous ketones. So drinking ketones in addition to what your body's making and or um, doing some fasting, intermittent fasting, longer water fasting, those kinds of things. Um, and I progress my clients into this very strategically so that it's graceful and they don't feel terrible. Um, but getting those numbers is what we're looking for. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's such an easy thing to test for with the ketone meters that yeah. it it's a really powerful thing. But I do think for anyone who's not in that like cancering process or doing the true therapeutic ketosis, there isn't really a need to chase super high levels of ketones. You're going to get the benefits when you're in that, you know, one to two range, like you said. So oh, I do think absolutely. that's important. I want to throw this out there because whether you're uh, cancering or not, there are some things that can actually prevent you from getting into ketosis that I'd like to mention because I know for my clients, a lot of times it's very frustrating when they're not getting the results, but they're doing it right. And I, I know that the discussion out there in blog land and podcast land, it doesn't a lot of times emphasize this. They're, they're making it like, oh, you do this and then you have this happen. And it's super easy and it's not. Mm -hmm. So there are some genetic SNPs that will make it very difficult for certain people to get into ketosis, not impossible. And it doesn't mean you wouldn't work for it, especially if you had cancer, but it, it can work against you. There's also different toxins. My, the one that I see the most is mold that if people have toxic levels of mold, it is very hard, if not impossible for them to get into ketosis because that mold is going to mess up a lot of the hormones, including insulin and the blood sugar regulation. And so addressing the mold, I still want them to do a ketogenic diet and we might add some other tools, but just knowing that, no, you're not insane. You're doing things right. Um, and not assuming that they're cheating. I've heard so many stories of people come to me and they're like, yeah, my, my person said that I was cheating and was mad at me. And I'm like, oh, that's just, like you need that on top of everything else. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's never a good thing for any practitioner ever to say to someone, unless you have verified proof that they're not being honest with you. Don't ever assume people are lying or cheating. Just no, there's a reason for it. Let's figure out what the reason is. Maybe it's because they're lying and cheating. Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe they I have, have a genetic issue or an environmental issue. Yeah. I've never found it to be the case that the person's lying because if they're going to a practitioner and paying for it, they want, right. they want help. It's just a matter of the practitioners a lot of times don't know that there's these genetics and toxins and things going on and they don't even know what to test for. And that's where it can be frustrating to the client that's like, I'm doing all the stuff and I'm not getting the results. Am I crazy? Yeah. And sometimes it's just a matter of give it more time. You know, sometimes we just, especially if you've lived a, you know, traditional sad life for a really long time. You know, your liver has a lot of recovering to do before it can make ketones appropriately. And it takes a while then for your body to use them appropriately. And so sometimes it's just a matter of give it more time, keep doing it, keep going. But yeah, I think you, there's certainly a level of investigation. If things are not working, then there's a reason for that. It's not that you're broken. <laughs> it's not that you're not savable. It's just that we have to figure out why. What's going on? I'm so you glad back. you said that because that was me. When I started doing keto, I went in hardcore 
And it took over eight weeks and I was being yeah. meticulous. And I remember like just laying there thinking, wow, my nose itches. That's too much energy to itch my nose. Like, mm -hmm. and it was shocking to me that I was, it was that hard for me to shift. And since then, you know, all this stuff about keto has come out and they, again, they make it seem really easy. Oh, in a few days, you're going to be burning fat. And I'm like, please don't say that to people because mm -hmm. a lot of us that are doing this are pretty metabolically broken. I mean, that was me and it doesn't just happen, but I was functioning well. Like I was still active and looked normal on the outside, the entire cancer journey, but I was very metabolically broken and it took me eight weeks to really feel and see the shift um, metabolically going on. Yeah. Yeah. It for sure can take quite a while. It is not a couple of days for most people, <laughs> people who truly need to go on these plans for therapeutic reasons, whether it's a true diagnosis or just, you know, improving metabolic health, it's not going to happen in a couple of days. It's just not. So yeah, for sure. Give yourself more grace than that and realize that this is not a quick fix. This is not a fad diet. This is not an overnight success story. It's going to take time. So just be patient, stick with it, go forward with it. You may also feel worse initially for a couple of days. So that was going to be the next thing I wanted to ask you about when people first transition into a ketogenic lifestyle or really any dietary change, things can get worse before they get better. So what are some things that you see that people maybe either didn't prepare for, didn't do right, or need to think about or need to add in, in addition to just adding the fat and changing the diet? Oh, yeah. So the way I did it is not the way I have my clients do it. <laughs> Same. It, was, it was not graceful. It was hardcore, intensive, rip it off like a Band-Aid. Um, but it was it's with, with my clients, there's two big things that I see that they need to do proactively. So that is more graceful than what I went through. So the first we've kind of already touched on, it's making sure they're digesting their fat. If they're not digesting their fat well and they're eating a moderate fat diet, they can kind of get away with it and not notice it. But if you shift it up to 80%, they're going to feel awful and that's easily avoidable. So my favorite is to do some coffee enemas, um, <laughs> which I'm sure doesn't surprise you, but there's also a lot of great supplements and things that you can support that liver and the gallbladder and everything with to make sure that that's more graceful. Um, the other thing is the electrolytes yes. and you'll yeah. see this discussed. And so I'm just going to give you guys a little backfill. I think it's very fascinating, but when you, um, one of the functions of insulin is that it signals the kidneys to recycle sodium. So if you are eating lots of carbs, then you should have lots of insulin and you should be retaining that sodium. So when people talk about retaining water and, you know, stuff like that, it's like, okay, this is a carb thing. It's not a salt thing, um, but that's a little side bunny trail. If you get the carbs down, like a ketogenic diet, you'll get the insulin down. Again, there could be other issues there, but when the insulin's down, you're not going to be retaining the sodium. You're actually going to be dumping it in your urine. So you want to make sure that you are intentionally replenishing those electrolytes, whether it means you just put a lot more salt on your food. And by that, I mean the unrefined sea salt, so none of the white stuff, or you can put it just straight in your water, or you can have one of the fancy electrolyte drinks like Element, or I really like Ultima because it's got a, a lot of potassium, which with a ketogenic diet, that's the one area that might be running a little low naturally because usually potassium's in the carbs. So I like my people to get some of that and that's going to have, you know, be with the electrolytes and everything as well. So if you, if, if you go slowly into it and don't bomb dive into the ketogenic diet all in one, you know, full sweep, and then add these two components, rarely do I see, I'm trying to think, I don't think of any, can't think of anybody that's had a hard time with it. If you do it that way, it works really well. Yeah. Same. Those are the, exactly the same two things I see frequently with people is they go, well, three things, I guess they go too fast, too much, too fast. Yeah. And then, yeah, their, their stomach and their digestive system isn't super happy with all of the added fat overnight. And then electrolytes is a huge one. So for sure, mm -hmm. those are the same three I would have mentioned myself. So that's awesome. Any other parting words that you'd like to leave everybody with if they're facing a journey of cancer or they're afraid of that diagnosis, or maybe they're, whether they're actively in it, through it, starting it, afraid of it, whatever, any parting words? 
Oh yeah. Thanks. Um, so here's the thing, like there's, we don't need to be afraid of cancer. We have amazing tools to see it coming and to work on it and prevent it from recurring. And I'm going to drop you the link to my ebook, how the roadmap to prevent recurrence. So you can actually see the different tests that I use and the approach, but we have this knowledge and that is power. It's just a matter of applying it. So the big thing is, you know, cancer is not caused by one thing. The standard of care and most people are looking for one thing. And it's not one thing. It's going to be a perfect storm of a whole bunch of things off. And those things are going to be different for everyone. And those knowing what those are, are going to give you very direct focus on which modalities, treatments, supplements are most helpful and which are actually going to be detrimental. There's a lot of things like IV vitamin C and hyperbaric oxygen that are amazing, but they actually can be work against and, and inflame things and make it worse to the point of driving death if it's done, if the person's in the wrong metabolic state. And you can see this on test. Um, and a lot of practitioners aren't running the test, which is super frustrating because it gives alternative therapies a bad name. But this is stuff that's out there that people need to address because standard of care does not look at why. It only is focused on make the tumor disappear. Yeah. And that if you don't address the soil that allowed the cancer to grow in the first place, I mean, is it any surprise when it's allowed to grow right back. No, it shouldn't be right. Yeah. I love that. We will for sure link up that ebook for everyone to grab. Where else can people find you if they're interested in learning more about your work or maybe working with you? Yeah. So my website is cancerfreedom.com and there's an application on there. If people are interested in working with us, um, I am on Facebook, nutritional Pilates and Instagram is just my name, Katrina Foe. So I would love to connect with people. Um, super passionate about dispelling the fear because that is only going to make things worse. And there's so many amazing tools we have that really bring hope and excite me to see people getting to use. Yeah. I think it's such a powerful message to just tell people that there's no rush. If you get a diagnosis, like you have time, you can think about things. You can get lots of opinions. You can do your own research. You do not have to make a decision the day you get your diagnosis of which path you're taking. Exactly. Find out, ask around, get some additional information. Talk to Katrina before you make any serious decisions because you have time, you have choices, you have options. There's lots of things that you can do and you don't need to panic. That's certainly not going to help any. Yes, exactly. And I have so many clients that have been rushed and bullied into treatment super fast and then learn more as they go along and kind of regret it. I mean, it's, yeah. there's a time and a place for standard of care, of course, but you know, they, they come to realize that this is, didn't address the issues and then they'll come in and do the work after, which I'm so grateful because, you know, when you feel like you're done, you don't want to deal with it again, but that's what you need to really make sure it's not going to come back. And you don't have to live with that waiting for the other shoe to drop feeling, which is so haunting. Yeah. And these methods that we've talked about today will help you if you're going through the conventional treatment as well. These will yes. reduce the side effects. They'll help you recover faster. They'll just make all of it more successful. So this doesn't also have to be an either or situation. You can- I'm glad you mentioned that. Heal because... your body first and then do conventional. Yeah. And working integratively is, again, radiation and chemo are more effective if you're doing them in a ketogenic state or a fasted state. And, you know, even just simple things, like if you have high levels of mold, getting out of the mold, is just going to take a huge toxic burden that then allows everything to work better with standard of care. So it can be very integrative, um, depending on where you're at, it, it works really well. And we just customize based on, you know, what's going on and concurrently. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Great information for everyone out there who maybe has cancer in their family, like get ahead of it now. Let's, let's deal with it before it becomes a big issue. And if you're already dealing with it, you have options. So thank you so much for sharing all of your amazing information with everyone and giving people hope. There's a lot they can do. There's a lot of control they have, and there's a lot, you know, a lot of options. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. To everyone out there, be well and vibrant. We'll catch you again on future episodes. 
Thanks for being a faithful listener to the podcast. I'd love it if you left me a five-star review on this podcast so that others can more easily find this valuable information. Did you know I also work one-on-one with clients? I approach solving health challenges like I approached solving crimes by conducting a thorough investigation into your case. Sadly, hundreds of millions of people in the U.S. have insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, and diabetes, and the vast majority have no idea. I'm here to fix that. If you struggle with low energy, stubborn weight, hypertension, sleep disturbances, or any other undesired symptoms, let's talk. All you have to do is schedule a free call. The link will be in the show notes. And no, you do not need to live near me.